Chemical Foundation of Life, Chapter 2, Part 7. Functional groups. Functional groups are very important for the macromolecules that we find in organisms. These are the points at which are the places on a molecule or a macromolecule that will interact with another molecule. So functional groups are very important. Molecules in biological systems are reactive or interactive, and it's the functional groups that are attached at those key locations on the macromolecule that are responsible for those interactions. And so chemical reactions in biological systems rely on those functional groups. We'll see that we have some key examples of functional groups that we need to know about for our course and will help to explain how some things work in the natural world. Functional groups have unique chemical properties. Sometimes they actually give materials a particular smell or consistency or taste or flavor. They're going to determine the characteristics and chemical reactivity of molecules, how they're going to interact with one another in an organism or the cells of an organism. Some examples of functional groups. An amino group, if we see that as part of a structure of a molecule, we automatically know that that molecule is going to have some alkaline or basic pH properties. On the other hand, if we see a functional group that's called a carboxyl group, on a molecule, you will automatically know that that particular molecule will have the characteristics of an acid pH or acidic pH. So simply seeing those amino groups as part of the structure of a molecule gives us a lot of information about at least some of the pH characteristics of that molecule. Again, many chemical reactions are occurring simply because of the type of functional group that's attached or part of the structure of that molecule. We see interactions and exchanges of electrons or atoms at the site of those functional groups between molecules. This chart is going to be an important study feature. I don't know if it'll help for you to rewrite it in your own words create it in some kind of format so that you could use it to help you study and review. But learning the names of the groups in the first column, the chemical and structural formulas in the column two and three, and then essentially the where is it found in the last column. I'm not going to require, and usually most students aren't required to learn the ball and stick model, um, that might help you to understand what the illustrations are showing you in the structural formula column in the middle. Um, so the structural formula model in the middle and the ball and stick model right next to it on the immediate right are the same functional groups. It's just the ball and stick model sort of fills out the shape and the size of the atoms in those functional groups. So we're going to review and describe these functional groups that are important in biological systems. You've certainly probably heard of alcohols like ethanol, which is the drinkable alcohol, acids like vinegar that we use in salad dressing. I'm not sure most students have heard of ammonia too much. Um, it used to be ammonia was a very good household cleaner, and it still can be found in small amounts in some window cleaners. Uh, most of us know at least what rubber might be like in terms of wheels or tires or other materials. ATP, we're going to talk about that more when we get into more depth discussions of how cells function. And then other chemicals like ketones and aldehydes. If you've ever heard of formaldehyde, which is a fixative that we used to use to preserve um, you know, dead material that we wanted to study, or if you've heard of fingernail polish remover that was based on acetone. So acetone is the classic solvent that's used in the chemical fingernail polish remover 
um, that your mother or grandmother might have used. Though nowadays there are lots of other kinds of solvents that are used for the different kind of nail polish or nail treatments that are available. Acetone is the classic original nail polish remover. So if we take a look at chemical structures that are called alcohols, the functional group that we find on those molecules is called a hydroxyl functional group. It's essentially an oxygen. It's a hydrogen single bonded or covalently bonded to that oxygen. It's illustrated in a generalized formula at the top. So this chemical formula at the top actually also mirrors sort of the molecular structural formula. We have an OH, which is the hydroxyl functional group. The R stands for any larger hydrocarbon or carbon structure that's attached or has the hydroxyl group attached to it. We look here the first example right below, and that's methanol, or methyl alcohol. It has a single carbon and three hydrogens, a methyl group. That's why we call this methyl, CH3, alcohol for the OH. The next one on our list is ethyl alcohol. We have two carbons with the appropriate number of hydrogens attached. So ethyl alcohol, also called ethanol. Propyl alcohol, most of us haven't heard of propyl alcohol. It has the three carbons and the hydroxyl group attached. And then many students have heard of isopropyl alcohol because that's rubbing alcohol. That's here at the bottom. You can see that the placement of the hydroxyl group is on the what we call the number two carbon. Scientists number the carbons. They map them out. So one, two, three. And so when we have a terminal hydroxyl, we're going to describe that alcohol as propyl alcohol or propanol if it's a hydroxyl that's attached to an internal carbon between the two ends. So here's an internal carbon that the hydroxyl attached to. We call that isopropyl alcohol or isopropanol. So methyl alcohol methanol, ethyl alcohol ethanol, propyl alcohol, propanol, and isopropyl alcohol, isopropanol. Ethyl alcohol is the drinkable alcohol that we find in beer and wine and in distilled spirits. Methyl alcohol is called wood alcohol, and it's sometimes used as um, maybe something in uh, something a little bit flammable that we might want to use um, for heating or such. And of course, isopropyl alcohol is rubbing alcohol. So any molecule that contains a hydroxyl group as part of its structure is just generally called an alcohol. Another functional group that's important is the carbonyl functional group. The carbonyl functional group is simply a carbon to which an oxygen is double bonded. We can find these carbonyl functional groups within a chemical structure. These R's stand for side groups, which can be long hydrocarbon chains, they can be other kinds of structures. It's simply illustrating that wherever we find this carbonyl functional group, it's somewhere within the structure of the molecule. When we have this internal carbonyl, then we describe this whole structure, this whole molecule, as a ketone. And this carbonyl is a ketone group. If, on the other hand, the carbonyl is at the end of a molecule, which is illustrated here on the right, we call that an aldehyde, or have an aldehyde functional group. Ketones versus aldehydes, really important for different types of chemicals, especially in an organism like a human being. Whenever you've heard of somebody having a buildup of ketone bodies, it's kind of what they're talking about. They're talking about molecules that have those internal carbonyls, and a buildup of ketone bodies has a particular effect on human metabolism. So a terminal carbonyl, we describe that structure as going to be an aldehyde. An internal carbonyl, we would describe that as a ketone. 
we do find some molecules or macromolecules have a combination of both a hydroxyl and a carbonyl functional group in one location. When that happens, we create a new word and to describe that functional group, we call it a carboxyl functional group. A carboxyl functional group has one carbonyl plus one hydroxyl in the same location, which is illustrated here in this middle structural formula or structural model. Here's the carbon double bonded to the oxygen, that's the carbonyl. Here's the carbon with a single bond to the oxygen of this hydroxyl functional group. So carbonyl, carboxyl, carbonyl plus hydroxyl. If we take a look at the illustration at the bottom, on the left hand side we have citric acid. Citric acid is one of the chemicals that we find in oranges, lemons, and limes that causes those fruits to be very sour. There's actually several acids, or we call these weak organic acids in those fruits that give them the pucker power that we rely on in the distinctive flavors. Notice that in the formula for citric acid, we have all the atoms present, and they're all illustrated with the type of either single or double covalent bonds. For citric acid, another name for citric acid is tricarbolic, tricarboxylic acid. Tricarboxylic means three carboxyl groups. There's a carboxyl group here on one end, a carboxyl group in the middle, and a third carboxyl group on the other end. Tricarboxylic acid. If we mix citric acid with water or put it in some kind of aqueous environment, aqueous meaning water, we find that it can serve is what we call a hydrogen ion donor. These hydrogens that are part of the structure of some of the carboxyl groups become donated. So these hydrogens on these three carboxyl groups in citric acid can essentially detach from the parent structure and we wind up with these lone little oxygens and they're going to have essentially an extra electron that was left behind. And we see that we now have this citric acid that has essentially highly negative charge associated with the structure. And notice that we're going to change the name to describe that this is an, what we call an ionized form of citric acid, and we call it citrate. So citrate and citric acid are really the same chemical. It's just citric acid is in the unionized form and citrate has been ionized. And part of the interaction that's occurring here with citrate to donate those hydrogen ions is that it's in a solution and it's also present things like sodium chloride where it could be interacting with some sodium. And then the hydrogen ions had floated off or the hydrogen that was attached to the parent structure are interacting with other ions in the solution. So anytime we see a carboxyl functional group as part of the structure of a molecule, we automatically identify that that particular molecule is going to be an organic acid. So citric acid, succinic acid, oxaloacetate, acetate or oxaloacetate um, uh, acid, those are all going to be having uh, carboxyl functional groups as part of their structure. If we see an amino functional group, which is a nitrogen with two hydrogens attached by single covalent bonds, we're going to find that the amino group automatically gives that particular molecule the attributes of a base or an alkaline pH substance. We call those molecules that have an amino functional group as part of their structure amines. At the bottom on the left hand side we have an example of a molecule of urea. It's part of what's released by our kidneys when we have waste products that we're trying to get rid of. Amines are weak bases. 
And so whenever you see an amino functional group as part of the structure of a molecule, you automatically designate that particular substance as a weak alkaline or a weak basic material. And it's described as a hydrogen ion acceptor. So it's the counterpart to the carboxyl functional group. Carboxyl groups can donate hydrogen ions. Amino groups can accept hydrogen ions. And we have different chemical reactions. On the previous slide, there were two test tubes, one green and one blue. And here on this slide, we have two test tubes, one kind of a peachy orange and the other one's a nice bright pink. Those are chemical tests that we can perform looking for those types of molecules that are weak organic acids or weak organic bases. Here we have another functional group that's, I call it like the king of functional groups. Phosphate groups are incredibly important in biological systems because whenever you see a molecule that has at least one phosphate group attached, you need to automatically know that when you have that phosphate group attached to that molecule, that this is a highly interactive molecule. The presence of that phosphate group, because of the nature and the structure of that phosphate group, which is illustrated on the right-hand side nicely. Um, notice we have a full negative charge on this oxygen, a full negative charge on the next oxygen right above it. This phosphate group is what I call bristling with negative charges. It's very interactive. That's why I think of it or describe it sort of as the really important sort of top of the list functional groups. It's definitely going to have that ability to interact dynamically with other molecules and that's why we see it in structures that we call ATP, which is a source of chemical energy in a cell, or structures like um, AMP, or adenosine monophosphate. We'll talk more about ATP and AMP and some of the other types of molecules that contain phosphate groups as part of their structure, again, as we move through the chapters during the semester. But please do make certain that you know the functional groups can recognize their structures, and what some of the common examples of those functional groups are, including the phosphate group. Another functional group that you may or may not be acquainted with is the sulfhydryl functional group. If you have naturally curly hair, you can thank sulfhydryl functional groups. The reason that naturally curly hair is curly is because we have more sulfhydryl, sulfur, and hydrogen functional groups than hair that's naturally straight. The old-fashioned permanent wave solutions that were used probably for your grandmother or great-grandmother um, actually introduced sulfhydryl groups, these sulfur-containing little functional groups. That's why they didn't smell so good. Nowadays there are ways to introduce those same types of sulfhydryl groups into hair to make it curly with a permanent um, wave procedure, but they've managed to tame down the smell and still get the curl. If you've ever smelled rotten eggs or sometimes rotten meat, some of that smell is due to the sulfhydryl groups released by that rotting food. If you've ever smelled a skunk that has sprayed, the spray from a skunk has a high concentration of sulfhydryl groups, a sulfur to which a single hydrogen atom is attached. And then to simply that structure, that sulfhydryl group, attached to a larger other structure, that's what the R stands for, something else, probably a carbon structure of some kind, is going to have some kind of distinctive smell. A fairly common example of a sulfhydryl group containing molecule is hydrogen sulfide. That's what you're smelling in the rotten eggs, and the spray from a skunk, and in fact, down at the bottom of the ocean, sulfhydryl groups are sort of key in the foundation of a whole separate system of organisms living and growing using geothermal energy and sources of energy from minerals and other materials at the bottom of the ocean. Again, there are biochemical tests that we can perform to look for the presence of sulfhydryl groups.
and that's what's illustrated in these test tubes. With test tube number two, and this black material at the bottom of the test tube, indicating the presence of sulfhydryl groups. Any type of molecule that contains a sulfhydryl group, these stinky molecules, are collectively called thiols. So again, the rotting material coming off sm smelly, stinky eggs, um, from the spray from a skunk, those are thiols because of the sulfhydryl groups. So why are functional groups important? Why learn about them at all? Well, you know, it's okay, so they're really interactive, and we're told that they're really important. But let's take a look at these two hormones that we find that are important in mammals, especially in human beings. Testosterone on the left and estradiol, which is the most potent estrogen, on the right. You might vaguely recall or have heard of testosterone and maybe vaguely have heard of estrogen. You might have some idea in the back of your mind, perhaps, or maybe more than that, that there's an important characteristic about testosterone versus estrogen. Well, yes, indeed. Testosterone is the hormone that tends to give an organism male sex or gender characteristics, and estrogen is the hormone that gives an organism female characteristics. If you take a look at the two molecular structures of testosterone versus estradiol, do you see a lot of differences in the chemical structure? No, you don't. There are really only a couple of subtle differences between the two. If we start on the right for both of them, we have a hydroxyl functional group on both. We have a methyl functional group here. There's a hydrogen on both. Hydrogen on both here. Hmm, there's a hydrogen here. Still looking pretty similar until we get to this position. And every place you see an angle on these, we call it three stop signs in a house, every angle has a carbon. And that's sometimes not clear to students when you first see these sort of of really bare um, structures, of sort of these little stick figure structures of molecules. But every place you see an angle on these drawings, there's a carbon. So notice that in, on the right hand side for estradiol, where I'm sort of circling, there is nothing attached. Instead there's a double bond, which is illustrated by these two lines. But on the testosterone, there's a methyl functional group present. On the bottom, we have a carbonyl on the left for testosterone and an alcohol in the same position for the estrogen. It's those two simple little differences plus a couple of double bonds that differentiate estrogen from testosterone makes a huge difference in the organism as to how much of each hormone is present. Just simply based on those two tiny differences in two functional groups on the structures of these molecules. So functional groups are incredibly important in biological systems and so we'll talk about them off and on for the remainder of the semester.